Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. Happy Climate Week 2021, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Alice Rodriguez, and I'm the Deputy Director of External Affairs for the California High Speed Rail Authority. And um, thank you again for joining us. We love that you've uh, decided to join for our uh, webinar with the release of our sustainability report. That report is meant to provide a summary of environmental, social, economic governance information for the year. This year, the report's focus is on how the high-speed rail system contributes to building an equitable future for California. Um, me, maybe like some of you, you know, we hear those terms like equity and sustainability, and they can be expressed in a myriad of ways, and they can mean different, something different in a myriad of contexts. Um, so with that kind of in our minds, we thought today's topic lent itself more towards a discussion, a discussion focused on what sustainability and equity look like in the work that the authority and its partners are doing to deliver the nation's first high-speed rail system. So in a minute, I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists to have a conversation, but first I'd like to introduce them. I'll start with Anthony Williams. Anthony serves as a member of the board of directors for the authority and his day job, he is director of public policy for Amazon in California. Previously, he served as Governor Newsom's first legislative affairs secretary. His leg legislative experience, excuse me, <clears throat> includes serving two California Senate leaders, John Burton and Daryl Steinberg, for whom he was policy director and special counsel. He has also been a legislative advocate for the Judicial Council of California and a senior executive and chief lobbyist for the State Bar of California. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you. Good Join to be you. here. All right, joining him is Meg Cedaroff. Meg was appointed by Governor Newsom in 2019 to be the Director of Planning and Sustainability for the Authority. Her responsibilities include policy development and implementation, station and station area planning, greenhouse gas emissions inventory tracking and offsets, renewable energy planning, sustainable design, and district scale sustainability approaches. That's a lot, Meg. <laughs> Uh, she is an urban planner with two decades of experience working in sustainable infrastructure, land use, and transportation planning throughout the United States and around the world. Prior to her appointment, she led the sustainability division of the authority as a consultant. Okay, um, rounding out our group of experts is Egon Turklin. Egon is a senior advisor for economic development and transportation at the Governor's Strategic Growth Council. He's helping lead the region's Rise Together initiative for the Governor's Office of Planning and Research and the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. He's also an adjunct instructor at both Stanford University and the University of San Francisco. Prior to joining the Governor's Office, he was the Regional Planning Director at SPUR, where he led dozens of projects on the intersections of economic development, regional planning, workforce preparation, land use, transportation, and governance. Welcome, Egon. Great to see welcome. you. Thank you for having me. Sure thing. And, th and welcome, Meg. <laughs> We're colleagues, so it, it didn't come out naturally, but welcome to you too. <laughs> I want to thank all of you, uh, all three of you for joining us today. Um, before I turn things over, I, I wanted to um, go through a few things. Um, you can find the full sustainability report um, and additional program resources at hsr.ca.gov forward slash sustainability. That's on the screen there. A quick link is also available on our homepage if you're able to just go there and you'll see it um, right down the, at the top. Um, at the end of this uh, discussion, uh, Meg is going to provide a brief update from this year's report. And it, it will be brief. So for a more in-depth update, you want to tune in to our board of directors meeting this Thursday at 11. Uh, to join that meeting virtually, just head to our homepage that morning and uh, there will be a view live link. So it's really easy to access should you be interested in hearing uh, more about this uh, report. Okay, uh, one last housekeeping item. Um, I'd like to encourage uh, our attendees here to use the Q&A feature to type in any questions you'd like to ask the panel. Um, we're going to make time at the end of this program to take a few questions. All right, so Mo, if you want to go ahead and take that slide down, I think we'll get started. Um, so again, welcome to the three of you. And I think, you know, a good place to kick off this conversation is to kind of get to the core of things. And so I was wondering if each of you can tell us kind of very personally, what does sustainability mean to you? Why is it important? Um, Anthony, why don't we start with you? All right. Well, thanks, Alice. And again, thank you uh, for having me. This is a great uh, time to be having this, this important discussion. Great in terms of where we are with the project and, um, you know, all that we're uh, celebrating and, and recognizing um, today and these weeks. So appreciate uh, having the opportunity to, to join everyone for this conversation. 
Um, you know, I, I just got to say that um, I think when I think about sustainability, um, both really both personally and, and professionally, it, it really is um, and just how I see the world, right? It's, it's you, when, when you're doing a project like this, you are adding to an existing fabric. Um, and that is a, it's a, it's a social fabric. It's an environmental fabric. It's an economic fabric. It's a physical fabric, right? Um, and so, um, in order to, 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 um, bring, ensure that the benefits that you were being brought, uh, you know, to, to bear and, and to that system, um, you know, you, you want to make sure that the burdens that are felt by that are balanced. Um, and I think when you think about when we, I mean, that just kind of big picture as I think about it, you know, making sure that um, that the, the the benefits of of the project, um, uh, you know, uh, are shared broadly, um, and that the burdens are also shared and minim and 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 minimized. And so I think from a sustainability standpoint and success. And long-term success of a project, you want to make sure that you're balancing all those and looking at all those in the, with the right lens. And I think historically, um, we haven't done that um, as as humanity. When you look at you know a lot of things that have advanced us as a civilization and and economic development and technological development, sometimes it's come at you know um, you know real big expense to to certain segments. Um, of society, and whether that be, you know, uh, from an environmental standpoint, uh, whether that be from, you know, so certain social circles and and people who have been been displaced and affected by um, that um, advancement. So I think as we're thinking about this project, we are taking a hard look at ensuring that um, you know the benefits that we are bringing and the the, the all the great things that. That a you know a high an electrified high speed rail system would would generate for us, um, you know, is also mindful of the impacts of bringing that system to bear and and how that's going to be, um, you know, received by you know that fabric that I mentioned at the beginning. So I I tend to focus more, and we'll, I know we'll talk about it a little bit more, but you know, I certainly have lived in in I'm from the Central Valley and have lived in this area. I'm from there, so. I, I know I know what we're doing, um, you know, and obviously know what we're doing from a from a big picture standpoint, from a policy standpoint, but also know what we're doing from an impact standpoint. So um, I think across the board, um, we, we want to be mindful of that, and make sure that, um, that we are we are um, taking into consideration that the benefits and the burdens are equally shared. So. Let's see. I'll turn it over. Let's see. Do, do I get to pitch it to? Why, yeah. why don't I pitch it to? Why don't I pitch it to Egon, and then uh, and then we'll have we'll have Meg close us out. Right. Thank you, Anthony. No, I, I I love what you say about really thinking about the people in the place, and I think that like many of these words, these are concepts, and and they get applied. But I think part of what you hit on is is how I wanted to think about sustainability, which is around balancing of different ideas and taking this long-term view. And, and it might start with a recognition that we haven't been living or doing things in a way that was sustainable. And on a personal level, I have two daughters who are growing up in a world with a set of impacts that's different from mine. They, there's certain fears and challenges we had that they're not facing, but there's a whole lot of other ones that they are facing. And so to me, you have, with sustainability, it's recognizing what is that long-term view and the actions we make, the decisions we make, are there for a long time. We build something, it's there for a while. If we built it in the right way, did we build it sustainably, but also then the impacts on particular places. So the for, yeah, first to me is kind of long-term thinking. Um, the second one, the second part of sustainability to me is also seeing things as part of a much bigger system. If um, we do a great job of, let's say, cleaning up um, the industrial area in a particular city and community, but that industry is pushed out and then we continue to buy everything from another place. Have we improved sustainability? We might've improved mm -hmm. our individual community and that's important and that, that's critically important. And I'm thinking about things like take the San Francisco Bay. It's not in, in, you know, in the Central Valley, but it has gotten much cleaner over the last 30 or 40 years and as industrial areas have been cleaned up, but our demand for industrial products hasn't totally changed. And so I think putting a sustainability lens requires us to step back and say, 
what's our impact on this much larger system? Right. Um, I think we all see that, you know, air quality and smoke impacts cut across larger geographies, water impacts, and, and we're trying, you know, a big impact in the Central Valley is, is changes from water investment and how to make sure we are sustainable in the amount of water we're taking out of the ground. Um, but then just to close, I think you can't do it with a narrow lens on just one topic. You've got to see multiple issues. So as we're trying to get to sustainability in water, what's the impact of those policies on the people that work in those industries, in those places, in those communities? So sustainability requires um, thinking across all of that. And to that, let me turn to Meg, whose job <laughs> is in part director of sustainability to help make Great. this happen. Great. So we're never just thinking about environmental sustainability. We're also looking across social and governance topics, you know, looking at the economy and the economic impacts as well as the social impacts. And I'd say, I think what, where you started, I mean, what you both have said have, have resonated with me. And I'd say that long-term view is key to sustainability. It's kind of taking us out of the okay, I got to get through today. I got to do the thing today. And, and frankly, we're all human beings and human animals. We, we kind of can get a bit greedy, just focused on meeting our needs. So sustainability actually challenges you to take a step beyond the today and think, all right, how is this going to be used over the long term? Is this a decision that actually affects positively influences and affects the long term? And can it be sustained for the next several generations, right? Not just today. And then I think what I find most welcome in the sustainability lens is no longer thinking that we can do development, we can build a big project, we can, you know, enact a particular change without really, really thinking through, you know, what is its influence on the underlying socioeconomic conditions? How is it influencing the community in which this project's being built? Have we engaged with the community in which this project's being built so that it is achieving meaningful results for them and we no longer consider it acceptable to sacrifice air quality, water quality, or our global climate when we're making these decisions? They're part and parcel in how we choose to act and Balancing among those can be very tricky because mm -hmm. for sure there's still trade-offs in that space, but by bringing them all to the fore, we're making a series of, I think, better decisions in the long run. So That's such a good point. I mean, I think about this from the standpoint of, you know, um, the board and the board's mm -hmm. sort of um, responsibility and imperative here in terms of guiding this project and as a director you know i sort of think about you know what is what does it mean to have a robust sustainability policy you know for our board and it, and it mm -hmm. is i i think it's it it hits on that meg it hits and it hits on you know i think what we're all talking about here you know we we have a fiduciary duty to deliver a project that is economically feasible and, you know, meets the immediate demands and promises that, uh, you know, we've made in terms of, you know, operability and, you know, all of those things, right? We want to, we want a safe and secure high-speed rail system at the cheapest cost. <laughs> if we stopped there, right, if we stopped there, then there are a lot of things that would be sacrificed in that conversation because we might build a route that goes right through, you know, wildlife and, and land use issues. And we might put stations where we shouldn't ordinarily put them because of, you know, uh, you know, transit oriented, you know, ignoring transit oriented development and, and ignoring all these things. And we might disproportionately impact, you know, poor, poorer working class, you know, minority areas because we, we're not, we don't have that lens. And I can tell you that as a as a board member, I think as hard as it is and it should be hard to get this done and to get it right, it would be much harder if all we focused on was the short term, let's deliver this project in the cheapest possible way. Those are serious and significant considerations that we have to have. Um, but if we just stop there, we would be ignoring huge long-term costs. We'd be ignoring huge long-term impacts. Um, and so I think the board sees the seriousness of, of really focusing, um, you know, on sustainability and, and, and 
taken this task to heart and, and, and to some degree so far delivering. I'm really proud of what we have been able to achieve as an authority in terms of the recognition of what, you know, Meg, you've led and a lot of people have worked on to make sure that we are, we are getting that right. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a really important responsibility for the board. Anthony, part of what you're saying, I mean, Meg, I'd love to actually hear you talk about sort of how you bake sustainability and also equity into these, into the decisions that are made, right? Anthony, part of what I'm hearing from you is that they have to be core to everything you're doing from the outset. So each decision, it's, it's not sort of a little bit at the end, oh, let's make sure we did this sustainably. You can't, it can't be right. an afterthought. It has to be an initial point. I know that that's been a huge um, area of work that Meg, you've been involved in kind of throughout. Sure. And, you know, it's um, the we we are a public entity delivering a series of mega projects within a program. And so there's a series of um, of uh, like responsibility coats that we put on as we approach our work. And but as we do that, I think we recognize that, well, we'll be in construction for 15 years until we get a system in operation. And so we couldn't just say, you know, dear public, in 15 years, there'll be this amazing transportation good for you. You'll be able to whisk yourself on clean, renewably run high-speed rail um, across the state, which is a fantastic outcome to get to. And so to your point, Anthony, it's, Tony, <laughs> mm -hmm. to your point, it's, yeah, we want to get there as quickly as possible. But if we only focused on all of that decision making to do that as quickly as possible, we would miss out on the fact that the power of our contracts, the power of our delivery has the capacity to start to start moving the needle on how infrastructure is delivered in the state. And that, to your point, I think because the board, because our executives asked us to do that, asked us to pay attention to that a decade ago, the results we see now are, yes, we have a construction project that is significantly less impactful than it would have been otherwise. We've recycled 100% of our concrete and steel. We've recycled 95% of everything that's come out of the construction project to date. That's reinforcing that recycling economy that we want to do in the state. We want that economy reinforced. Um, but by the same token, we also recognize, well, how do we do engagement? If we actually want this to be an equitable project, we or to achieve equity for the state, we also have to have conversations with a range of people who, you know, may not have historically been involved in infrastructure discussions. I think our outreach team gets a lot of credit for really, really um, exploring the ways that these conversations can and should take place, and how we bring that back into a very technical, complex infrastructure delivery process in a very important way. That's oh, me. <laughs> um, you know, I am curious, Anthony, from a policy perspective, and you you have a rich uh, set of experience around this, what type of effects should we expect when a mega project like this takes on that mantle of sustainability goals and fa fairly aggressive sustainability goals, right? We want to be carbon neutral in construction. Yep. No, I think it's a great question. And it's sometimes, um, you know, some of those impacts um, and effects are um, in the time it takes, just the time it takes to get to, you know, um, the time it takes to, to really, whether it's break ground, uh, mm -hmm. construct it, um, and then start to operate it. So I, I, I say that to say, again, you know, if we, we, think it's very important that uh, that we um, engage with communities, that we understand, um, you know, the those communities that we're, we're going through. And and then we have some legal obligations. Right. I mean, our CEQA process is part of our is part, part of executing on our sustainability. Now, it happens to be a legal requirement. Um, but it also should be part of what we do. What is the environmental impact of what we are doing, right? And so when you think about those things, I know there's a lot of frustration. Why does it take so long? Why, you know, why? So one of the effects is that because you have to go through that very, very important process at the front end, it means that there's, it's going to take longer, right? So one of the effects is 
perceived delay, right? Um, and and you know, much of that delay can and should be explained by um, you know making sure that we're fully assessing what we're doing, that we're acquiring land in a in a you know in a again a sustainable way. We're developing the routes in a very sustainable way. We're fi we're making determinations. Where are we going to have wildlife crossings? How is this going to impact? you know, uh, other uh, parts of what we're doing. But then even I was, it was very struck by, I can't remember what which page it's on, but there's a graphic within the report that shows the completed rail line next to traffic and other community. And so you, you see the rail and you see mm -hmm. that there's a sound barrier to prevent noise and vibration. Uh, and then, you know, you, then there's a, then there's an easement, right? So you have all these things there because there mm -hmm. are, so that those are visual effects, right? It's, and those are costs, frankly. I mean, we could just lay the track and ignore yeah. what the sound and vibration is going to be for some of the communities that we're going through, but we don't, right? We don't. So the, these are really like critical, um, decisions that are made, um, with, with the lens towards, you know, or with an eye towards what is the long term effect and the long term policy implications. Because as I said earlier, you make if you if you get it right, and obviously you can't get it perfect. There's a you know there's a difference between getting it perfect and getting it done, right? Because you could spend forever trying to get it perfect. But but getting it as close to right as possible because down the line those negative repercussions, and those negative effects are going to get more and more amplified. Right. And then you're having to come back. And what is our fiduciary duty to impose future costs on taxpayers and others? Because it's got to be fixed. It's got to be right. redone. It's got to be whatever. Right. So. Um, so, again, those are from a policy standpoint, it makes sense to get that balancing right. But it also obviously you got at some point you got to go. Um, but I think those those are some of the things I think is very important for the public to to see and for us to always be mindful of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I agree. I think it, you you've you've touched on the we're building this in in specific places, right? This is no longer a theoretical concept of high speed right. rail. It's high speed rail in very specific communities and very specific locations, very different communities, right? California is a it's a complex state. We cross a lot of different communities. Um, you know, I know to some people, I'm from the Midwest, right? They look at the Central Valley and like, oh, it's all the same. You know, no, it's very different. Yeah. And um, I think to that effect, the more we can do to appreciate, um, a to be to be fair, as we are building the system, right? We we need to um, control our costs, but we still need to be able to to do things correctly and. In communities, I think we wrestle with that quite a quite a bit. Um, I I think I want to pivot slightly, maybe to Aegon, and see if you want to draw out a little bit more about this new community and economic resilience fund. Because to to Anthony's point, there's a lot we feel needs to be done in the context of the system. But as a high speed rail program, we may not always be able to do specifically, although we may hear about it in the context of the project. And I'm wondering how maybe you could talk a little bit about that fund and what it is and how it's going to promote economic equity and sustainability. Yeah, no, thanks, Megan. And maybe I think this is so helpful to kind of yeah, get step back and slightly bigger picture, which is that um, when we when when the governor came in, had really a focus and an interest in looking at economic development opportunities in all parts of the state, but with a particular interest in inland California, including the San Joaquin Valley. Um, in part because there's tremendous need, um, and 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 part of the need is quality jobs, better jobs, but also economic diversification, a wider range of industries that people can work in, which is a need everywhere. Right? That's, I mean, some parts of California have a more diversified economy. Um, and so that, that regions rise together was sort of part of that spirit of saying, how do we help communities and regions develop a more diversified portfolio? But another key component of that is this idea of that I mean, one size doesn't fit all, which you're kind of you're you're, you're getting to, um, but also put regions in the driver's seat of deciding what some of the investments can be that are needed to move them forward. And so this is, I think there's a number of ideas around that that we we've been trying to to put forward of how do you encourage people to come together across 
sectoral boundaries across county lines, across city lines, private sector, with community leaders, with labor groups, um, with, with local government and, and, and regional and state government people to look at what are the needs of this particular community and how do we move it forward in a different direction? How do we build a different kind of economy, a high road economy, um, mm -hmm. we might say. So I think we're fortunate this year. And I, I, to be clear, the Community Economic Resilience Fund, is it passed the legislature, still needs a little bit of ink signing in, in the budget <laughs> process because it was part of that very last piece. So um, we can't fully count all the chickens as it were, but, it, I th but, but, th but just to give the kind of broad concept of what this has been about, well, many people have been involved in, in helping shape it, but it really has a couple of components. The first is um, how do we encourage regions to come together to set a table to figure out the direction they need to go? And a lot of parts of California have done this. Fresno has been through a process the last couple of years called Fresno Drive. Kern County has been through a process called B3K that we helped um, put some funding into to, to get that going. And those are examples of processes where bringing a lot of people together, looking at what drives the local economy, what are industries that are potential areas of growth, what are industries that, that aren't growing as much anymore, what can we do about that? And then what you specifically, what do you need to work on in this community? What's something that's gonna unlock potential? And again, in Fresno, we at the state level, we're able to put some funding into helping um, with a kind of a food tech innovation hub that might be in downtown Fresno, connecting Fresno State and UC Merced. And the reason I'm kind of giving the details is it has to be about the kinds of jobs and industries in many ways that are already in a place that can grow and evolve and, and move up the value chain. So there's, there's a wider range of jobs, but you start from where you're at and that's the important thing. And there's so many existing companies and a lot of exciting things happening. Um, carbon capture and storage in Southern San Joaquin Valley is a lot um, taking place there. There's of course um, changes going on transportation and logistics and distribution, um, renewable energy, there's been big growth. So you look at those industries. So the idea of this fund is that um, Governor's Office of Planning and Research with the Labor Agency and, and Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development um, would help kind of seed some of these regional planning conversations. But then the bulk of it is to invest in actual economic development projects in the regions of California. Mm -hmm. And that's something we really haven't had the resources to be able to do. Um, and we hope that it's seed funding that then you know, unlocks other potential programs, right, other potential investments, including from the federal government. Um, but but that's that's sort of this, you know, the simple idea. Initially, there are these sort of events for, for, for having a larger conversation, and then there's investment um, in, in specific projects, right. including a lot of the communities in the Central Valley. Right. And in some of those communities right around high-speed rail stations, which is why like, we couldn't be more excited about getting the system up and running. And not just in the Central Valley, but I think we really want to see it connected statewide and as soon as possible, because the sooner these communities, which, again, as you're growing and wanting to diversify economies in these areas, that connection to the different economies of the state is key. Right now, it's you'll you'll have an hour trip between Fresno and San Jose, or you'll have an hour trip or less between Bakersfield and, and Los Angeles. That's dramatically different in terms of how we think about the state, how we think about our communities and these economic connections. No, that's an interesting point. Actually, I'd love Anthony's take on this, yeah. but, but actually high-speed rail had a really interesting graphic a couple of years ago that showed the rail system we had in the late 19th century that connected all these communities. And you know, Fresno was a stop on the train station and someone right. laid out a grid. Now you've got a city of half a million and a region of a million with, with a variety of industries that, that's moving forward. But when we, when we located Interstate 5, it was on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley. And so to folks in Southern California and Northern California that were not in the Central Valley, a lot of those cities, Fresno, Bakersfield, Merced, I said, were off the quote mental map of a lot of people in California. Now, they weren't off the mental map of the people there. They're very real communities and places where people doing great work, but high-speed rail reshapes that map, kind of puts it you know, right down through the spine of the, those communities. So I think for many others, the millions of others in California, high-speed rail can reshape our perception of where opportunities exist, where connections are, where um, an investment in a company that's starting up in a downtown Bakersfield or a downtown Fresno that you might want to have a relationship with if you're coming from Los Angeles or the Bay Area on the one hand. But I think, so that's one side of it. But Meg, you're also talking about 
how does it directly benefit people in the communities there and the ability to get between hubs? Um, and one just little example I think is, is interesting. There is a, um, a company called Bitwise. It's been connected to, to high-speed rail in, in started in downtown Fresno um, and has a a lot of people doing um, startups that are, that, you know, in, in a facility in downtown Fresno, but people from the community, when they expanded, they looked to expand in downtown Bakersfield and downtown Merced, in part because of high-speed rail. How do we connect to those cities in the center of those cities where people in those communities can start companies, can be able to you know, work face-to-face -face with each other um, as needed, but have these increasing economic relationships? So it's sort of a both and connecting within the geography of those communities, of course, make it faster for everyone um, and then, you know, connect to the larger state. Right. Man, Andy, I'd love, I'd love your yeah. perspective on that, yeah. kind of the connections across the state. Or no, I think, it's, I think it's really important because um, it, goes, it goes to some degree to what you were talking about earlier in terms of that economic diversification, right? When you're limited in terms of the industries that you have access to from an employment standpoint, um, and an opportunity standpoint, I mean, it's great. Hey, I, you know, if it weren't for, if it weren't for, uh, you know, two of the major industries in Kern County, oil and ag, I, my family, you know, would not have been able to su support and sustain itself and contribute to my education. I mean, it's like, I, I am a beneficiary of that, but I also know looking ahead, Hey, we, we need to have diversification. We need to have more, you know, um, you know, opportunities that, um, you know, that exist in other, let's call it more densely populated or urban areas where you have a range of choices and you have a, a, a very diversified workforce and skill sets and, and all that comes with that. So I, I do look forward to, to, to that, um, this helping to, to um, contribute to that and, and bring that about and having companies, uh, you know, locate in, in the Central Valley where, you know, Maybe the uh, the fault lines are a little bit more secure, and you know you got other other benefits that you know that it that that brings. Um, so no, I I I you know I definitely I definitely see that you know see that happening. But at the same time, we also have to recognize again in terms of sustainability, um, and and the disruption to the quote unquote the fabric that I that I mentioned earlier. You know the the you know there are aspects of the community that would be impacted by that, that could change, whether it's increased population or, um, you know, a different population base or whatever the case may be, those things have to be taken into consideration and recognize that and 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 recognize that there may be anxieties that go along with that. There might be folks who, I, I got family there and say, I, you know, do I really want to change my community, right? And then you have to really talk about and think about what the benefits are that that, that brings. Um, and so, no, I, I do look forward to that. I, I did want to ask Meg, I, I, and, I, and maybe because I, I love that we we're having this hyper local focus to our conversation, but I wonder if we can pull out a little bit, right? Because we have a, you know, a uh, sort of an existential crisis that is facing not just our local communities, but our national and international, like the entire globe, which is climate change. And I, I wanted to see if you know, I could have you, you, if you have some perspective on like, what is, what, what does it mean that this project and the equity that this, you know, the equity system that we're talking about in terms of high speed rail, what impact does that have on, is that going to have on climate change? I mean, some people think well, we're so disconnected from that. Like, you know, everybody feels like we don't really have an impact on, on climate change. How does that come into, but also, and then the second part of the question is you've worked on these things across different industries. How is this project different from what we've experienced in other projects? So sorry to hit you with two questions at once, but I wanted to get your, your perspectives on that. Yeah, it's two very juicy questions. So it, it it's hard to, it's hard for your average person to hug a ton of carbon, right? We don't, we don't know what that means. Our CO2, <laughs> we don't know what that means. I think what we have seen though, is it, it, over the past year, uh, across many different geographies in the U.S., suddenly our our world is has changed. It's not changing; it's changed, and the 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 events, the intensity of those events, the chaos that we're seeing around them around them will only continue unless we act with some 
some purpose and clear intention right now. And I'd say High Street Rail is right in that spot where we look at our existing behavior, which is flying in planes that run on fossil fuels, driving billions of miles in automobiles that still in the main run on fossil fuels, despite the intense policy pressure and industry evolution we're seeing in the zero emissions vehicle space, we still need high-speed rail as a tool in order to, as we were discussing earlier, connect these communities so that you don't have economies that are dependent upon something that's dependent upon the current climate conditions because those are changing, right? We need to have a diversity of economic opportunity in many of our California cities. And, you know, high-speed rail alone is a big project and delivers tr delivers true value to California in terms of just reducing carbon dioxide emissions straight up, but also delivering these co-benefits of connecting communities, providing mobility. And this is a topic uh, Egan and I uh, very wonkily discuss all the time, which is reducing VMT or reducing vehicle miles traveled. Mm -hmm. Because to your point, you know, the, it is a careful balance we need to make within these communities to evolve. But in many of these places, people more and more say, I would like to be able to do more things in my day without having to drive everywhere. And so the more we can also start to influence very tangibly the opportunities, help those communities that are currently vulnerable to climate change to have more economic opportunities to even harden their space or help them to achieve mitigation in those spaces. I think the project plays a plays a really strong role in that. And very tangibly, we developed a climate adaptation plan for the system, right? This is a tens of billions of dollars of investment in a piece of infrastructure that spans the state and needs to be in place for the next hundred years. So we've taken a really hard look at climate models and understand where we might have vulnerabilities and where the communities we're situated in may also see vulnerabilities. And we are trying to piece together both how we adapt the system to be resilient in that space. I say it's great working with engineers because they love mitigating risk and avoiding, mm -hmm. avoiding hazards. That's kind of a prime directive for the engineering crowd. But by, by the same token, where we have the stations, there's opportunities to explore way that explore ways that we put in the stations to, you know, improve the immediate surroundings for those communities, mitigate some of the difficulties they're seeing relative to climate change, and make a difference. So we make a difference on the global scale, but we also make a difference on the local right. scale, which, you know, that is where we all relate to this issue. I think. Um, and then I can't remember the second part of the, the question. second question oh. was just, yeah. Yeah. In terms of your, your experience, uh, you know, having worked on, um, you know, how does, how does our approach to sustainability differ from other projects that you've worked on? You know, um, we take a very comprehensive approach, right? We sat down with our stakeholders and said, it's not enough to just pay attention to, the future and operations, you need to pay attention to construction. It's not enough to just pay attention to environmental resources, which are, you know, the core of, I'd say, environmental sustainability. Writ large, sustainability looks at social issues, equity, the economy, and our governance structures as well. We need to take that comprehensive look at sustainability. And I'd say um, I've worked on, on different projects, some of whom have when they talk about sustainability, they have a real critical lens on uh, employment and jobs and opportunities and getting jobs and opportunities to, you know, workers that um, have been incarcerated or otherwise need more skills development. That to that project is what was important from a sustainability lens. And there are other projects where, you know, water resources or air quality resources are the top issue when it comes to sustainability. And so, What's interesting about high-speed rail is how comprehensive it is, a comprehensive look we take. And I'd say we have an incredibly aggressive approach to not just reducing carbon emissions and operations, but we've taken a really hard look at construction and the materials we use and the supply chain we have so that we start to move the needle on how supply chains are delivering on um, the environmental quality of their materials as well. That's great. And I was going to maybe jump in on the, on the first question yeah. in part, what, yeah. what, we, what you see in, in, all, in other places all throughout the world that have 
built high speed rail systems, and there are many, and there you know, are you know our peers and partners all all, all across the world. But it, it it's not just a train. It's actually a train system that unlocks a lot of other investments that start to make sense. And I think this is, or maybe put in specific terms, you arrive on a train in a city, it means then you have to figure out other ways to get around that's mm -hmm. not maybe how you've been accustomed to, which is always driving your own car and finding places. You might hop in someone else's car, you might hop on a train, you might find um, you know, a local train. And that, so what you've seen in many communities is then it unlocks the desire in those places to have a different set of transportation options for people. Yeah. It doesn't eliminate other options, it establishes and creates more options. And that's really what we haven't done enough of in California is give people viable alternatives to, to the one that most of us do most of the time, which is driving around by yourself in your own car. And lots of those countries that have high-speed train systems, people still drive their own cars many places, but they have an option to do a different way of travel in many communities and that that's really where and that becomes that starts to become the sustainability yeah. difference is that you have you have a, a, another way and then that accrues beyond just the carbon savings from the electrified train that you take oh, yeah. it's then the all those other trips um that, that that start to change and sort of translates it out right it's kind of an unlocking potential totally like you've seen right. and i really like that i was sorry meg were you gonna no I was just going to say, you know what I like about what I'm hearing there is just this, this um, it, it sometimes, and it's, you know, no fault, it's the world we live in. Um, we get a little myopic about how we see the world and we see what's right ar around us. And, and so for us, I hear about, oh, California is this car culture and it's really hard to get people out of their cars, which is true for a lot of people, but it's also not true for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. An automobile is very unaffordable to a lot of working families in this state. And there are a lot of people who rely on public transportation that is woefully inadequate in a lot of communities to provide opportunities for access to work and school and all sorts of things, right? And so to, the, to exactly what you're saying, Egon, if we, if we create a system that then creates another system that is improved, that mm -hmm. spreads benefits to people who may not actually even use the train. Yes. It, it, it provides these additional benefits. So it's, it's, I mean, it's what I, what I always come back with is what I started with, you know, being a kid from the Valley, being a kid from Bakersfield, um, I am always going to take a look at how we're doing. This is like, you know, I, I feel like my personal stake in this, right? It's like, I have an obligation to, to raise these issues um, to make sure that the policy decisions that we're making we're making them with an eye towards everybody who's impacted. And, you know, I talked about the benefits and the burdens. Historically, the, ben the benefits have been to one group and, and the burdens have been placed on another. And mm -hmm. so we have to be really, really focused about how we do that. And that, that's the kind of thing that, you know, I'm so glad you, you made that point because it, that's the kind of thing that we need to be thinking about. Like, what, how are we ensuring that we are doing this in a, in a way that that balances those things out and i think about i'll just leave with this because i know we, we're, we're getting the the cane here as this is why alice came back on but um but like i live in huntington beach it's a very you know upper middle income community very different from the community that i was born in right and i think to myself and i know because we just the board just approved uh the eir for the the bakersfield to palmdale route right and so i know where that's coming through and i thought to myself if that segment was going right through the middle of my neighborhood in huntington beach how would we be thinking about constructing it how would we be thinking about what we're doing around it what is the mitigation that we would be doing what are all the things we'd be doing it wouldn't it wouldn't we wouldn't think of neglecting the impacts to the surrounding community, right? Because number one, that community would be organized, they would be vocal, they would be on it. But even when they're not, if we closed our eyes and disregarded where we were and only gave regard to who we, the fact that we were impacting people and lives in the community, how would we think about it? So I just, that's sort of what I wanna to bring to this conversation. And I think that is what creates that long-term sustainability that mm -hmm. balancing and all that good work that I think will make this a successful project for many years to come. 
Sorry to suck up the last. I don't know if I sucked up the last few minutes, Alice. You can. <laughs> no, no, great, <laughs> great place. Great place to stop to, and and we appreciate that as a, in your leadership role on our board of directors. It's nice to hear. It's actually killing me to stop this conversation because I think I could I could binge watch these kinds of conversations about sustainability and equity, um, and what we're doing this transformative project. So. I, I, it just killed me to do that. Sorry. <laughs> we were loving everything you guys are saying. Um, but we do have a few slides. We wanted to kind of let Meg uh, talk a little yeah. bit about the sustainability report and kind of other some other highlights there. Um, and then we'll get into a QA and a and hopefully maybe continue this conversation a little bit. Uh, Mo, if you want to throw those slides back up, I think um, we'll start with slide two. And I think Meg can kind of uh, take it from there. Sure, and I will be quick because I am looking forward to the question session coming up. So um, as I think we, we hit upon in our discussion today, the, the High Street Rail Authority looks at sustainability across a range of issues and topics because we've, we have sat down with our stakeholders and said, okay, what, what makes sustainability real for High Street Rail as a project? And what we heard back um, and we're also responding to, to our board and executive leadership and where they have set goals for us to achieve. And um, we set a goal to have the construction of the project uh, be quote unquote carbon neutral, right? We know we will be combusting uh, fossil fuels in order to construct the system, but we're going to do projects that are sequestering uh, carbon dioxide and providing other co-benefits at the same time, because we respect how important it is to be doing that as soon as possible. And the the great news is, you know, every year when we do our sustainability report, we're following a standard approach. We're um, using the same standard that uh, many of our peers use. And so um, it's helpful to just be able to talk about the same information consistently over time so that folks, our stakeholders know they can come to this report and reliably understand the information that's in there and know that they can look to past years and see similar pieces of information. So you see here uh, what I call a smorgasbord of sustainability indicators and topics on the screen. We've offset or sequestered or avoided over 300,000 metric tons of carbon through both tree planting and then um, keeping land in ag, uh, ag easements. We also, um, from the social standpoint, have dispatched more than 6,000 workers. Real jobs for real people in disadvantaged communities, living wages that allow these families to pay their bills and have a home is incredibly important for this project. And they'd say, this is a testament to the great work that our small business and Title VI team is doing, as well as the compliance officers on all of our construction projects. But we also look at the small businesses we're engaged in. We focus very keenly on how much of this investment is going to disadvantaged communities. But then from the environmental standpoint, we also take a look at what are we doing relative to air quality? Are, are our practices in construction still continuing to demonstrate improvements over sort of a business as usual standard? And to date, we've avoided over 200,000 pounds of criteria air pollution, which is crucial to do because we're building in a very sensitive air shed and we want to respect that and do as much as possible there to improve that construction. So let's jump to the next slide. You'll see that's actually specifically about our um, practice to use the cleanest available equipment. That means we're avoiding these criteria air pollutants in real time. We have a construction site that is demonstrably cleaner than sort of your average construction site in California. Um, and this is also reinforcing the overall economy where we're building up more and more um, cleaner equipment to be available throughout the state for construction. On the next slide, we talked about this quite a bit in our topic with um, Director Williams and with, with Aegon, climate adaptation and understanding that writ large, not just about our infrastructure, but how and how it needs to adapt to changing circumstances, but also those ways where we intersect with the local community and can help with resilience within that context as well as part of this plan. And this isn't, this is, um, we published uh, the highlights of this plan on our website. The plan is available internally as well. And we will be updating that as we move forward because the thing we know about climate science is that is a very evolving space and we want to be keeping a close watch on a number of these issues. On the next slide, again, it, we're, an important part of achieving our, a, a cleaner future, right? In the first 50 years of operation, we deliver 100 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions reductions. It's 
hard for one project to achieve that much, but that speaks to the power of having such an appealing um, transportation tool at the disposal of Californians. We're also avoiding hundreds of thousands of tons of pollution and crucially, even as we look to electrify all, uh, all transportation, the system's also reducing energy overall and writ large because it's incredibly efficient to move a thousand people on a high-speed rail vehicle, much more efficiently than a thousand Teslas. So uh, just to wrap up, I think ending where a lot of the conversation was going with, um, again, and, and Anthony on the next slide, you'll see when we talk about equity, and using an equity lens, when we're looking at these investments we're doing, we, we know that infrastructure in the past was not done always very well by many communities and served as a division. And uh, high-speed rail was, was required in our, um, in Prop 1A to follow other transportation quarters, which, quarters, which means we have to hew pretty closely to other transportation quarters, which means there's a danger of maybe reinforcing some of that division. So we've looked really closely at how the stations themselves start to providing, provide a bridge and re-knit communities together that may have seen divisions in the past. And I mean, like really specifically bridges over rail systems that aren't just, um, are, are utilitarian to be sure. Uh, this is uh, before you something that's incredibly easy to maintain but it also serves as a gathering place, as a means of uh, traversing um, many different cities along the alignment in a way that is inviting to the community, enriching the public space and providing these connections that have been missing in the past. And you know, conveniently for us as a rail system, bringing more and more riders onto the system because we are greedy to get as many riders as possible onto high-speed rail. So that's a quick, uh, summary of a few highlights from the report. It really is a robust approach to many different topics on sustainability across the organization. It's a reflection of the work of every team within the authority um, and is uh, a really strong collaboration between my team and the communications team as well to make such an easily digestible. Um, they take all the nerdy science facts that we cough up and make them uh, much more digestible to folks. I think that's it. If we want to go to um, questions. Yeah, questions. Yeah, uh, that's great. Okay. So um, I'm going to, there's a few questions. I, I think I want to start with this one and it, it kind of goes back to that kind of hyper-regionalism that we were talking about, but I think it's important because this also impacts, it talks about impacts to the state of California. Cause I, and I, as a person who does external affairs, I get this question quite a bit you know, this question of why did you start in the Valley? Like people just don't understand that. But the question is, what's the significance to the state of California for the, the work starting in the Central Valley? Like how, what was that significant um, impacts for equity, sustainability, that kind, of, that kind of thing? I don't know who wants to take that. I'm looking knowingly at uh, Director Williams, but I'm... <laughs> I, well, I can. I, well, there were there was both a practical, I think, practical consideration and a fiscal consideration. That is, our federal dollars were tied. I'll start with the second one, which is that our federal dollars, many people know this, were, were tied to uh, beginning the first operable segment in um, the Central Valley, um, and so that is a huge consideration. Um, but I think there are a lot of good reasons for that. Um, you know, not the least of which is that that corridor is one of them has one of the worst air quality um you know uh, zones in the state um and so cleaning up the you know creating a creating a trans transportation system that helps to reduce um you know that pollution uh was a significant factor in getting those cars off the road um and and uh reducing that that pollution so um, and, you know, and we talked about some of the economic considerations, too, and bringing, you know, a more diversified, uh, you know, att attracting a more diversified uh, economies to the to the region, um, I think, are also a lot of good reasons why um, that Central Valley segment was was the first. Meg, do you want to add to that or Egan, either one of you? Yeah. Well, um, I'll, I'll be quick again and just say that, you know, yes, the investments in the Central Valley, but the the impact overall to California's economy is still in the billions. Yeah. Right? It's not like the 
the economic influence of it is is really felt through throughout the state and not just in the valley, though there's that direct uh, benefit there. Egon? Yeah, and I was just going to add, I mean, part of it is also you want to demonstrate the speed of the system in a place where you can yes. go fast on long distances where it's reasonably flat, flat. So there, there's, there are sort of technical advantages, but I think it's often, this is sort of the mental map point. I think a lot of people in other parts of the state don't really, there are millions of people in the Central Valley today, I mean, four and a half million people and growing quicker than other parts mm -hmm. of the state. So there, there are transportation needs in the existing diesel Fine train, but it is not clean in an area, as Anthony said, that has you know, the worst air pollution um, in, in certainly in the state. Um, electrifying that has direct and immediate benefits when, when it comes forward. Um, one other piece, just to throw in, I, I was gonna mention this earlier when we were talking about connections and opportunities. Um, the Central Valley communities each have a university and also have um, opportunities to kind of improve you know, educational outcomes and, and, and college graduation rates. But I think it's an overlooked, fact that you have connecting CSU Bakersfield and Fresno State and UC Merced um, as three important institutions. The ability for people to go back and forth between those to take classes, I think actually can expand um, educational outcomes. It will require a separate and related strategy to really make those linkages work between those institutions. Um, but I think it's sort of an overlooked piece. It's not the reason to start in the Valley, but it is a one of those um, potential um, outcomes that we'll get from it. Very good point. Excellent. Um, and I, this last question, and I think it's going to go back to Aegon, but maybe Meg too. Um, it looks like somebody that's in the know um, about planning, in fact, in those communities, planning grants. What does that work look like with those communities, um, whoever wants to take that, in those HSR uh, cities? There's, both, I mean, yeah. Well, Meg, yeah, maybe you can talk about stationary, and then I can mention some of the sort of broader planning work that we're involved with. It's a plan. So um, station area. So the authority has been doing station area planning or helping uh, local jurisdictions to fund station area plans for the past seven years. And now we're entering into a new phase of delivery, right? We're looking to put um, stations into the Central Valley communities. And so um, the authority is now taken on that kind of next step of much more specific site planning in a number of these locations. And that's important work to do because it starts to tease out a lot of the nuance in the very in the local place. But then um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done for station communities throughout the state, all the way from San Francisco through to Anaheim, where you know we can utilize the investment of the station in these places to achieve specific local economic development or or land use objectives. And I think Egon's work really ties to that very clearly. And I was just gonna build on that. You think about it sort of as nesting, you gotta do a lot of work within the station area, but then those stations are commu you know, neighborhoods within a city, within a region. And so we have another piece in the budget that is in, that are investments in each of the regions of California, including the eight counties of the San Joaquin Valley will each get on their own and, and other parts of the state to invest in projects that really unlock infill development, housing, and in a way that it's gonna support the reduction in driving. So how do you build the infrastructure, the water sewer in those neighborhoods and the communities so that so the development can happen? And that some of that could be in a station area, some of it could be in an adjacent neighborhood um, with an investment in other, other infrastructure, bus line, you know, bike, bike ways, you know, better, better, um, Sidewalks to get to and from those sorts of those sorts of areas. So we're we have an investment that is directly going into these regions, some of which will um, be used in a way that reinforces this. But much more to say about that. We hate to say this, but we're at time. <laughs> and I really meant it earlier when I said I would be very happy to just binge watch more of this. Next time we're going to do two hours, three hours maybe. There we go. Um, this is such an important conversation in California to for 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 stakeholders who want to know more about what we're doing, what we're building why it's important, um, why we're doing it the way we're doing it, right? I mean, it's such a valuable conversation, I think, in general. And so I want to thank um, all three of you, um, Anthony, Egon, Meg, thank you for joining us today and being such a, a part of this rich conversation. It's been educational and enlightening, and I just love it. Um, so I do have to ask Mo, why don't you slide or go to the next slide, the last slide for me, please? Um, I do want to um, say again, remind folks the reason why we're um, we're we're doing this webinar was uh, we just recently released our sustainability report, building an equitable future. Um, you can find that at hsr.ca.gov/sustainability. Again, you can also go to our homepage. There's a link to it there. 
Um, for more information, um, Meg is giving a presentation to our board of directors, so she'll go into a deeper dive about the report on Thursday. Um, it's at 11. If you want to join um, on our homepage and, and that morning, there will be a live link. You can just click in. It's quick and easy access on our YouTube channel. Um, and so I wanted to kind of give one last thank you, and that's to all of you for joining us today, for joining our conversation. Um, if we didn't get to your questions, I'm really sorry, uh, but please feel free to reach out. We're always happy to hear from you. Um, and with that, I'm going to say thank you and have